Thank you so much. Um, thanks to C.C. McDonald and Jack Garris for being here with us today. Uh, I'm Lal Zimmon. I'm a professor in the Department of Linguistics, um, and I'm going to be moderating our discussion. Um, so we now all know uh, who C.C. is. Um, we know that in 2011, um, she went through this incredibly harrowing experience of being harassed and then attacked on the streets of Minneapolis. Um, what we saw in the film is that, you know, rather than become another, um, another life for us to mourn, um, Cece fought back, and I think she really continued to do that in prison, um, and she certainly continues to do that now. Um, Jack Garris, who you won't know as much about, perhaps, since we haven't watched a documentary about her, um, <laughs> is a, a New York-based um, filmmaker and freelance TV producer. Um, she produced uh, a series um, in, the, in the Life uh, for, on public TV, um, and during that time, the series won a number of awards from the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association, from GLAAD, um, the Webbies, um, and mm. she's worked as a producer on um, TV specials and documentaries for the History Channel, Food Network, USA, um, and has won um, a number of awards for her um, earlier documentary work. Um, so, um, to kind of uh, kick off our, our conversation, to give you a sense of how this will go, I'll ask some questions, but think of your own questions as well. Um, we'll have some time uh, toward the end of our discussion for you to ask whatever might be on your mind. So um, start thinking about that now. Um, I wanted to start out with a question for Cece, um, kind of about your life before this incident happened um, and your relationship with the trans community. I mean, did you consider yourself an activist um, before this point? Were you thinking about these issues related to prison reform and criminal justice? Um, I, I can't honestly say that I, I probably wasn't as um, deeply um, connected to advocacy work or even the education around, you know, once the whole incident happened, that it took for me to go through this like really um, testing incident for me to have even, you know, had people to send me reading materials and to educate myself around um, what I now know as to be like, uh, uh, modern day slavery and white supremacy and um, and just, you know, but I've always had an idea of the ways in which my life, both being black and trans, were, were very different from other people and, you know, the, the, the basics of my life have always been now, in the past, and probably in the future are, you know, how am I waking up in this body and basically trying to figure out, you know, the ways in which, you know, I will be like attacked, you know, verbally or physically. And, um, and so I've always been a person that, I guess you can say self-advocated. I definitely knew who I was and, and acted on that. Um, and I definitely st um, stood up for like people in my communities, and I tried to be involved in the ways that I knew how um, best to do. And um, and I guess that I really didn't know, you know, what advocacy even looked like or meant because you know I wasn't never exposed to like that language or um, that community and. Um, and so, you know, now that I am and have been like knowing what this is, um, I can definitely say that that it resided in me, like that idea, to, that pushback, that resiliency, it always resided in me. It's just that it took for a situation like this for me to have like proper terminology mm -hmm. or, you know, what it means to be a part of like, uh, uh, abolitionist community, a radical community, um, and what that actually means and looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Jack, I'm curious the history behind you getting involved in this film. How did you hear about CC's situation? How did you decide to make this documentary? I was producing In the Life on public television, and uh, we were going to initially do this as a segment. Uh, we had done a um, conversation with Isis King and Janet Mock. And during that um, conversation that we filmed, they brought up Laverne Cox and 
talked about how she was a producer, and um, this was way before Orange is the New Black was even a thing. And um, so I said, let's meet Laverne. I want to know what stories uh, she would like to produce. And she came in, and um, she immediately said she wanted to do a, a story on C.C. McDonald and violence against trans women of color. And I had known about CeCe's story uh, because part of my job was to read, you know, the headlines across the country and internationally um, that affected the LGBT community. And um, I, I was immediately on board and I said, let's, you know, develop a treatment and, you know, research and, and see if we can get permission to film inside. Um, the prison, because initially we just wanted to speak to CC, because mm -hmm. we could see that all the coverage, I don't know if anyone here remembers the coverage, I mean, we, we of course show it <laughs> in the film, but um, we were so struck by how, you know, CC's story was being reported and, and the lack of her voice. Um, so Laverne was very, very, um, focused on, on having Cece tell her story and, and Laverne wanted to meet her and talk to her about it. And Cece had sent a, a letter to Laverne congratulating her, you know, over the course of us working this out. And it was like, I was kind of emailing you from, you know, okay. on the outside and it's hard to communicate to someone who's incarcerated. So I wasn't quite sure if Cece was on board. Then I got the word that she was on board and we had permission to go film and unfortunately the show went off air. <laughs> so um, cut to three months later, uh, I had to kind of have one of those moments where, um, you know, I guess if anybody sees this film, the thing that I'd want them to take away is that we all have it within our own, own power to act. Mm -hmm. And when you see an injustice and whether it's, oh, I know how to make a, a documentary or, you know, maybe, you know, I know how to make media or, you know, to go out and to, to take action. So I had one of those aha moments and said, you know, Laverne was, I think she was speaking at one of the GLAAD Media Awards on the West Coast. It probably was L.A. And she talked about CeCe's story and how no one, you know, was really talking about it. And just in that moment, I was like, yeah, why isn't anybody doing anything on CeCe McDonald? And I was like, why aren't you doing anything about <laughs> CeCe McDonald's story? And I was like, all right, <laughs> I'm going to do it. So called up Laverne or emailed her and I said, hey, remember what we were talking about <laughs> way back? And, and I was like, do you want to work with me as an independent producer? And she said, let me think about it, and I'll meet with you. We talked about it, and we decided we were going to start it up again. And, and the rest is history, <laughs> <laughs> as they say. So yeah, I would say um, if you see an injustice, you, you have it in the power of your own self to, to take action. Mm -hmm. Cece, what was it like for you to learn that someone wanted to make a documentary about you? I know you, you talk about in the film having, you know, that you went into prison feeling really down, feeling mm -hmm. like people ha were not there for you. And mm -hmm. I kind of wonder, you know, how, how you went from that to being the subject of a documentary and somebody that trans people across the country and world were talking about. I mean, even just outside of the documentary, when people started to like write me or you know, um, or just hearing like the demonstrations outside of the jail, right? Can you imagine being a person locked up in a jail and then all of a sudden you're hearing like tambourines and drums and loud horns and, you know, loud speakers and they're screaming free CC. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. And then, and then I'm literally like, I wonder how many people in here named CC. <laughs> and then you, and then you know that it's for you and like, you know, as a trans woman, just like, you know, most of my life, you know, I fended for myself, you know, 
Um, as y'all seen in the film, my mom said, you know, mentioned me like being outside of the household pretty early in life, um, you know, and and you know, I I pretty much been homeless since I was 13, um, and just being out on my own and being able and just being so very independent, mm -hmm. and so like. You know, when it was time for me to be depending on people, it was really hard for me mm -hmm. to to like have that, especially when I have been let down so many times in my life before, that it's like, oh, how can I trust people to, you know, handle something so serious as like my life being incarcerated when I couldn't get people to like help me with a phone bill that was $40 mm -hmm. or give me food when I was hungry. Mm -hmm. um, and so like I was definitely having conflicting um, feelings about like people being involved and like also not like wanting to be like the poster child for like trans violence mm -hmm. and like not wanting people to see me as a victim but you know also knowing that I was a victim and like mm -hmm. also you know being vulnerable you know like vulnerability like there's so much power in that um, sometimes but I think people see it as a weakness and I think that once I gave into my vulnerabilities and, and was able to uh, allow people to be in my life and to like really be a part of the, you know, that process and just to be a part of that was, you know, in itself um, mind boggling, you know what I'm saying? Like I've, I've went my whole life fending for myself and defending myself. I went my whole life not seeing people care for trans people. I went my whole life seeing negative stereotypes and stigmas of trans people you know, so how can I expect anybody to understand or care or, you know, give me the love or support that I needed and not necessarily what they wanted to give me? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, um, it was weird then for me, you know what I'm saying? Getting letters from people in, you know, in, in, in different countries, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. how did my story even get to a different country? I don't know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But like, people were sending me letters and, and, and along with some of those letters were like pictures of them like at this protest mm -hmm. and it's in Tokyo or it's in, you know, it's in the UK or it's in, um, it's in India or it's wherever and it's like, God damn, like why why do people care? You know what I'm saying? Like I know that um, you know, I, I seeing all of the the trans identified people in my life, you know, constantly being arrested and you know, pushed and filtered through the, you know, the uh prison systems and jails. It was like, you know, nobody was really there there for them or you know what I'm saying? So there was also like this guilt complex of like, mm -hmm. why me? You know what I'm saying? Like there have been so many other trans people that have went to jail or went to prison for the exact same things that I'm in here for. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, and you, I don't know, but you know, seeing people be so concerned and genuinely caring and like, you know, um, it just really gave way to like, me being able to be vulnerable again and just like allowing people to be in my life in different ways and showing up in different ways and like, you know, under you know, understanding that like if pe it's not other people's fault that they can't get me out. I think that was like the scariest part. It's like, well if you care then just get me out of here and it's like, well, you know, that's not how these systems work, you know. Mm -hmm. And so like when Jack and Laverne came along, it was just like, oh, you know, at that point, it was then like, this would be a good way for people to just hear my side of the story. Because like at the time, when it was first brought, you know, to my attention, and that's when the media was still kind of really disgusting, misgendering, you know, pretty much demonizing me and criminalizing me in the worst ways possible. Um, and so I really just wanted for me to have my side of the story, right? Um, especially after that stupid letter that like everybody went crazy, well, the prosecution, I should say, that the prosecution went crazy about it was just like, it really was insignificant, but they made such a big deal of it. And it was like, okay, y'all, I, I admitted to it. So like, why even keep, you know, pushing this letter? You know what I'm saying? Um, and, you know, I, at that time in my life, I was like, had come to like my own acceptance. And like, it was hard for me too, you know what I'm saying? Like dealing with like, 
you know, the death of somebody, the death of myself, you know what I'm saying? Like the regrowth of myself um, and like how to find myself through like this pain and this trauma and like, and like also like the fears of like the people that I love because like, well, a lot of people don't know or understand this, like, you know, there was so much, even like with the taping of, uh, or the filming of this documentary, it's like, this was like three, three and a half, uh, close to four years worth of a project put into two, two hours. So like, uh, people would never get the whole scope or the whole feeling, you, you know, this is what you're getting a piece of, or even the behind the scenes of like, you know, the, the people who attacked me who were still like harassing and, and like showing up to certain spaces and harassing people and like me being in jail and getting phone calls, well not getting phone calls, but like calling people and just like having those conversations and they're like, oh yeah, you know, today at the event that we threw for you, you know, these white people showed up and threw beer bottles or, you know, like mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that people didn't understand that was like, uh, the the darker sides of like the whole free CC campaign, mm -hmm. um, and so like having people be involved was also like a fear of the safety of others, the mm -hmm. safety of the people that I love, the people the people who were on the CC support committee. You know, Jack and Laverne, like the ways in which you know I was always considering the ways in which people would be affected by this too. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, how would it like for people to be supporting a murderer? Because, you know, that's how people saw me as a murderer and this and that. And it was just like a long list of things. So it was so many feelings. And, and to have somebody that wanted to like share or be able to like get this to the public in a way that I couldn't communicate with the public. Mm -hmm. It's like all I want people to know is like my side of the story so y'all can understand like you know this person was like a, a Nazi and was like out in on all of our streets you know what I'm saying this could have been anybody you know it could have been a visitor it could have been you know you know somebody that lived there or whatever which in the case it was and so like I just wanted to be able to like have an avenue to just be like, look, this is who I am, you know, and the media have portrayed me in these type of ways, but this is the real person that I am. I was somebody that was housing other homeless, you know, trans, queer, and um, LGBTQIA peoples, you know what I'm saying? I was, you know, a person who was also a student. I was a person who was also like homeless and just got, you know, a, an apartment that I can have of my own. And so it was like a whole story, you know what I'm saying? saying that people didn't get a chance to hear or get to see or you know what I'm saying or even just talking about the ways in which you know trans people and trans women and women of color specifically are like violently attacking your in, in, in our streets and like nobody's never really talking about that mm -hmm. but y'all want to like uplift the narrative of this white man who was a known abuser he had like previous cases of domestic violence and, and, and assault and like just so many different things and like mm -hmm. just get a chance to hear who I am so like you know to have somebody like Laverne and uh, you know I even get to say like I knew Laverne before everybody else mm -hmm. really got to know Laverne um even though she you know she she's been you know popular for a while but um like I felt like we all kind of met each other on the cusp of like our own like personal growth and like, mm, um, you know, um, like, you know, it was just like, it was a, it was a weird time. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was really close to getting out. So I was really excited about that, you know, and just continuing the work. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I was just really excited to just continuing, continuing the work. And it, uh, I, I, I'm sure Jack can attest to this, but like when we all met, I just instantly felt like they were family. Like I didn't feel like it was people showing up with cameras and stuff. Mm -hmm. I genuinely felt like it was people who, who wanted to like share my story in the best ways that they knew how, mm -hmm. um, and for everybody to have a way to share that and have that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jack, I, since Cece mentioned things that, um, you know, this was multi-year project, there's so much that could have been in the film. Right. I'm curious if there was maybe one th thing, one event or sequence that stands out as something more you wish could be there or that you would maybe put on a DVD extra. Yeah, there will be. Yeah. When we release it on DVD, there's like a whole scene of Cece and Laverne in a park 
and just you know filming them both in the park Laverne, you know, uh, makes a comment that, you know, a, a beautiful day in the park is different mm -hmm. when you're a trans woman mm -hmm. of color. You know, you can really seriously have violence directed towards you. Mm -hmm. um, and we just uh, had them walk around and kind of talk about, you know, what was going on in their lives at that, at that time. It, w it was always a scene that I loved. Uh, it's beautiful. It's also the picture that we've been using um, uh, to promote the film, um, just because they're just in a really happy space. <laughs> and it's not the prison. <laughs> um, but um, we had to, I had a cut that was like a hundred minutes long. And, you know, I just had to, you know, when you love something and you're so close to it, you do have to kind of take it and, you know, make it so that people can understand, <laughs> so I had to cut it out as, as sad as, I, you know, so there's mm -hmm. things like that. Um, unfortunately, that didn't make it into the cut, but people eventually get to see it, mm -hmm. yeah. It's really powerful too. I was thinking about the fact that, um, you know, the jury wasn't able to hear about uh, the, just the context of what trans women of color experience on an everyday basis. And I think to folks within the trans community, it's like, yeah, of course, you know, this is everyday life. Like if you know trans women of color, you know this happens. But, um, you know, I think that probably a lot of people outside of the community really have no idea what day-to-day -day life is like. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that you would say that about the jury because we did have a screening in um, the Twin Cities Film Festival. Yeah, it's very emotional. There was a woman in, the first screening at the Twin Cities Film Festival, which is obviously in Minneapolis. <laughs> and she spoke out afterwards at the Q&A and told us that she was actually going to be on Cece's jury. And the way that she spoke to Cece about how she felt about Cece's case completely changed your ideas of the jury yeah. members. Mm -hmm. um, she was very much for CC, <laughs> and I, I think that that was one of the most healing moments, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and at least I, I it, can only it was you should speak about it. It was definitely um, a reassuring moment, a reaffirming type of a moment, because I definitely, I think that was probably one of the major um, components to the whole case was <clears throat> the ways in which I felt like there was no chance for me to like come in front of like this majority white <clears throat> um, jury um, and also like the only there were uh, two other two PLCs on the jury one was a non-black PLC and the non-black PLC person was very anti-black um, and so I'm just like well if the if the only two people of color on the jury and one of them is anti-black, I can't help but to think what the what the white jurors are going to do. And like that whole entire day was just like a show for me. I was um, I had um, a migraine flare up, so I was like really nauseous, really sick. Um, I couldn't even get fully dressed, um, and like uh, the guard like. It's so weird because you have to go into a room and like change out of your jumpsuit and put on your clothes. And I was like, I don't want to wear my shoes. And um, and <clears throat> and he was just like, you know, trying to help me as much as possible. Um, how funny that is, right? Um, but you know, to have somebody come, you know, years later after you went through this whole incident and you had this certain type of feeling about the ways in which your jury saw you mm -hmm. and for a person to just pop up at your screening, um, which is also why I'm always so like fearful of like my life and the life of the people who are around me or even show up is because like um, a lot of the <clears throat> a lot of the people who are connected to me have like called up to places that I that I supposed to like you know, do an event at and tell them like not to host me. So like these people know where I show up at. These people know what where my events are and what that means for my safety and the safety of the people around me. Um, I'm always just on edge, you know. And so for this person to be like hop up and be like, you know what, Cece, I was on your jury side. So I, I was taken aback. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Because like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> like coming face to face with like something as serious as a person who was like going to determine your your freedom yeah. or or vice mm. versa and just you know i was just really positive. emotional it was just a lot and, and to also have them like just say you know like um that they love me and that you know, that they're happy to see where I'm at in my life. Mm. And, you know, I'm trying really hard not to cry because, like, that was just a, a moment for me, you know, for somebody to just, you know, <laughs> be a part of something so serious and, and just reaffirms, like, the ways in which I was even seen in that moment. And, like, you know, again, like, that was my biggest fear of that, of the whole case was, like, coming in front of the jury and just being, you know, like, having to go through that lived experience again and then to have somebody say, oh, well, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, you were attacked, you were, you know, you were violently attacked, you were this, you were that, and like, so many things that were, t that were like taken out, as y'all see in, in, the, in the film, like, you know, the ways in which he was like put on a pedestal and uplifted and then like certain things that were connected to my identity were just like constantly not being um admissible in court you know having somebody to come testify on just the ways in which trans women of color specifically are navigating you know our society in the ways that they're violently attacked and then to have the prosecution argue like oh no, that that's that has no importance to this case. Mm -hmm. And then the judge being like, you, you're right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And like, that's constantly the fear, you know, also that I couldn't even have a testimony in court. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That could be because of like some bad check that I wrote like years ago, years ago, you know what I'm saying? And, and them using that as a weapon against me and to say that, you know, I'm untrustworthy and that, you know, anything that I say in court can be inadmissible because, you know, this person writes f fake checks or false checks, so don't believe them. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, one, they were my checks. And two, like, you know, in, in, in a means of survival or like white people bounce checks all the time, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're not going around, Come you know, on. We're not going around and saying every white person is untrustworthy because they're they're writing ch checks that bounce right. and it's like you know I, how do you go against a, a jury like that when the prosecution are they're literally going to argue that mm -hmm. they, they, they were going to demonize me and criminalize me to the utmost and whatever they needed to do to get to get you know that prosecution to mm -hmm. to follow through with that and to make them the victor in this situation mm -hmm. um it's a nasty game and like i just didn't want to be a part of that and then dealing with a migraine on top of that it was just like a lot and mm -hmm. so you know i had to like on the spot um come come to like the grips of mind you i was ready for the trial i was you know like the jury was picked everything that's how far we got the jury was picked and I was so scared that next morning. I was so, so scared. And then there was, in my face, a plea deal for, you know, two years. And I'm like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Compared to seven years, um, that's, that's a big, you know, that's a big jump down. And then, you know, the way that Minnesota state laws work, you, you only have to do like, um, two thirds of the time and the rest of the time you have to do on pro parole or probation. And it was just like all of this stuff I had to like mm -hmm. come to like, do I want to do this? Do I want to go through with the trial? And it was like, and also it, it doesn't even mean that because that one person was in support of me, you know, again, when there was like a, a POC on the jury that was like, you know what, sometimes black people can be annoying and sometimes, mm -hmm. and it's like, yikes, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? How can, how can you go into a room feeling confident yeah. about that? Yeah, I was gonna um, ask you, I mean, after hearing that juror say that, did that change how you felt about deciding to take the plea deal? Uh, or would you feel like it would still just be too big of a risk to? Um, that's a big question, I guess. But. Um, I think that I definitely, I mean, the realities are this, and that's, at that point in my life is what, what I've had, what I've known, you know, at that mm -hmm. point was that, you know, this system wasn't created for me to win. There mm -hmm. was, the, how rare is it for a, a black person in general to like survive some type of traumatic experience and not be filtered in a system. We, if, even if we go back to like the 70s and, 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 
in the stories of the, you know, the New Jersey Turnpike or like Angela Davis or like Asada Shakur or like those stories that were like clear evidence of like the ways in which black and brown bodies are constantly being pushed in this system, a system that's, that was never meant for like you to succeed in anyways, right? We know that prisons are made exactly the ways in which just like Eric was saying, it's like they're made exactly the way that they were supposed to and like, um, and me thinking like, you know, and like the ways in which when you go to trial, it's like, um, the 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 court gives like the jury a packet and tells them like this is the law this is the way that the law works and you have to abide by this law when when you're doing this so if if they're arguing that I'm a murderer you know and that if this paper says and I fit that criteria of being a murderer that they have to like literally you know, rule in the, the favor of the law. And so like, if, if that was the, if this evidence is showing that I unintentionally murdered somebody, which is what the, 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 the charge was, and then added an intentional murder, if people thought that I intentionally hurt, hurt this person or murdered them, that, you know, you know, what are the chances that they won't see that? You know what I'm saying? Or believe in this law. And even if a person says, oh, CC, I support you, when you're, when you're given a certain type of criteria, you know what I'm saying? When you're told to follow a certain type of guideline um, when prosecuting somebody and you have to follow that, then what are my chances? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and like, there, there, there are no, you know, laws or anything protecting people um, when it comes to self-defense. Well, certain bodies, right? Because, you know, what's so funny is like, during the time of my case, it was the Marissa Alexander case, mm -hmm. and it was also the Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. George Zimmerman case. And like, all of our cases was around self-defense and mm -hmm. the ways in which certain people are allowed to claim self-defense and other bodies aren't, right? Mm -hmm. now. Marissa Alexander, she, if anybody doesn't know her story, then you really should be like educating yourself again. But basically, she's a black woman based out of Florida who also, uh, now mind you, Florida is a stand your ground state. Um, also where George Zimmerman killed Trayvon Martin. And Marissa Alexander was a, a black woman who was, who was in a, an abusive in, uh, interpersonal relationship. And instead of, you know, harming the person or 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 being a victim of abuse again. She fired a warning shot in her home, and and um and then so the police came and arrested her and charged her, um and then was found guilty, um on her charges and was sentenced to twenty years in prison. State minimum, uh, the minimum sentence was 10 to 20, and they found her guilty, and and was and then she was um, uh, uh, prosecuted and um, received a 20-year sentence for defending herself in a state that's a stand your ground state. You know what I'm saying? Um, which had everybody up in arms because it's like, okay, so George Zimmerman is allowed to stalk you know, this black boy and like get out of his car, attack him, shoot him, kill him, and and flawlessly claim self-defense and not even see time in jail. But then this black woman who is abused most of her relationship, she just had a brand, uh, you know, a newborn child. Um, this person has been known to be abusive. And, and instead of like shooting him or killing him, which is, which is the only way you can actually use a stand your ground defense, which is up because like, why do you have to kill somebody to, to only have those type of claims? Mm -hmm. But you know, she, you know, fired a warning shot and, and then to be like prosecuted and sentenced and sent to jail for 20 years. And she just, you know, her case was overturned and the, uh, <clears throat> no, her case wasn't overturned. Let me, I'm sorry. Um, her case was sent back to, um, to the courts cause she appealed and she still had to do 65 more days with her time served. And, uh, and then two years of probation and she just got off of house arrest. So mind y'all, she was on house arrest for two years and just got off January of this year. And, it, and it's like these systems aren't made for people of color, you know, to like thrive in. They, it, when we look at the whole prison population, right? 
if if ninety percent, if ninety percent, I'm just this. This is an estimate. I'm sure it's higher. I'm definitely sure it's higher. But if ninety percent of the prison population, which is two close to two and a half million people, if if ninety percent of that population is is black people, you know what I'm saying? But only thirteen percent of the world's population is black people. Well, this country is black folk. Then where are the majority of the black folk in this country, right? What does that say about our country, right? That most of the black people that reside in this country are incarcerated. So there was never, and, and just the history of, you know, the, the prison industrial complex and prison systems from the abolishment of slavery uh, uh, into what we know as the known prison system now, you know what I'm saying? Like, there was no way for me to succeed in a system that that's constantly attacking these certain type of identities and bodies where we are criminalized, right? I'm criminalized as a black person, but as a trans person, that's further, you know, perpetuated and stigmatized with the ways in which those identities are um, criminalized. So I didn't, I didn't see any space for me to just be like successful in that. And yeah, it was like at that moment is, you know, how do you take, how do you make a decision about, you know, even if it is two years, you know what I'm saying? How do you make a decision on like, oh, well, for the next two years, I'm gonna mm -hmm. be in prison, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? That's still, a, you know, that's still a hard thing to like, deal with but in my mind i'm like that's better two years mm -hmm. is definitely better than 40 or 60 years mm -hmm. and like that meant more to me than anything right being mm -hmm. able to like know that i'll be able there are literally people who are doing 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years because you know they had an ounce of weed or they had a you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and so like why even risk that on mm -hmm. something that's so grand and you know and even though um, what's his name? Uh, the district. Uh, I don't know his name. Yeah, Michael Nick Freeman. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't even like to say his name. Um, but um, just knowing that he, you know, who had so much power, he could have just, you know, said, you know what? Cece defended herself. Let's mm -hmm. not charge her. Mm -hmm. You know, there are better, you know, things happening in, in the state of Minnesota where we can be moving on this or moving on that. And he pushed so hard for them to prosecute me mm -hmm. in the ways that they did. And it's like, regardless of what he's saying in this film, like, I know what he was doing behind mm -hmm. the scenes. And I know the ways in which, I mean, anytime, you know, Again, if the prosecution is coming to the district attorney and being like, hey, you want to add a second charge to CeCe's case? And he's like, okay, you know what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. like, obviously he was wanting me to be incarcerated mm -hmm. regardless of what he says. That's what he was aiming for. And, um, and that's just the ways in which this, our society works when it comes to like black and brown bodies being filtered in prison systems. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cece and Jack, for joining us. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you to the audience um, and to the Thank staff you. who organized the event as well. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, y'all, for coming. Thanks for coming.